NATO troops landing in Norway, the climax of the biggest military operation ever staged by the Western Alliance. Codenamed Strong Express, these maneuvers were intended to demonstrate NATO effectiveness in protecting America's eastern seaboard, the western approaches to Europe, and the vulnerable northern flank in Norway above the Arctic Circle. Strong Express, which lasted two weeks, was the first full-scale NATO exercise involving land, sea and air forces for four years. 64,000 men, 700 aircraft and 300 ships from 13 of the 16 member countries took part. Whilst most of the ships were deployed in various parts of the North Atlantic, three aircraft carriers supported the Norway landing. The spot chosen for the invasion was Tromsø, high above the Arctic Circle and just 200 miles from the Soviet border. This area of Norway is the weakest part of the NATO defence system. It's a bleak forest land with few people, but of immense strategic importance. If the Russians captured it in wartime, the benefit to their navy and air force would be immense. Significantly, they keep 21,000 mobile infantry, 300 planes, and a naval brigade stationed close to the border. The only opposition is one Norwegian brigade, and so defense of the area depends on timely help from outside. That's what Strong Express was all about. The amphibious landings at Tromsø were an impressive demonstration of NATO efficiency and mobility. All the latest equipment was on view, including a military hovercraft which can transport troops and vehicles over land or water at 50 miles an hour. For the purposes of the exercise, the NATO High Command assumed that northern Norway had been captured by an enemy, tactfully referred to as Orange. The Orange Force comprised 4,000 men of Norway's Northern Brigade. It was the first time that a NATO exercise had ever used an active opposition. The NATO troops were codenamed Blue, and it was Blue's job to recapture Norway from the imaginary Orange invaders. The main reason why the entire Strong Express operation had to be mounted from outside is that Norway doesn't permit permanent NATO bases on its territory. Although the exercise had all the characteristics of an invasion simply because it had to come from outside Norway, the NATO forces were theoretically responding to an attack on one of their member states and therefore acting defensively. After the landings were completed and the beachheads established, the push inland began with the aid of helicopters and jets. Norway is almost totally dependent on external air support, because although there are 14 airfields in the Arctic zone, only four of these are up to NATO standards, and even these are vulnerable to the weather. In fact, the weather was so bad that little flying was possible. All the airstrikes were mounted from aircraft carriers. On the ground, infantry and armoured units began the counter-offensive to regain enemy-occupied territory.
helicopters were used to pinpoint enemy positions. As soon as enemy orange units were located, armored and airborne blue units were rushed in to engage them. These NATO exercises are not only the biggest ever staged, they're also the most important politically, mainly because of their timing. In America, Senator George McGovern, the Democratic candidate for the presidency, has declared his intention of reducing the number of US forces in Europe from 300,000 to 130,000 if he's elected. But he also says America will remain committed to NATO, believing that in the event of an attack upon a NATO member, enough American forces could be flown to Europe quickly enough to beat off the attack. It was one of the aims of Strong Express to find out how quickly and effectively such an external defense operation could be mounted. With the examples of the 1967 Arab-Israeli war, which lasted six days, and last year's India-Pakistan conflict, which lasted 14, the NATO commanders made speed the most important factor in the Strong Express operation. It'll be some time before it's known whether Senator McGovern's view is the right one. In Europe, there's concern about the future role of Norway and Denmark. Now that Norway has just voted to stay outside the European Economic Community and Denmark has announced plans to reduce its armed forces, the other NATO members fear that the Scandinavian commitment may be weakening. NATO commanders are hoping that Strong Express has convinced both countries that they still need a NATO military shield. One of the VIPs keeping a close watch on Strong Express was Lord Carrington, the British Defence Minister. Britain, which has no doubts at all about NATO, was using these manoeuvres to find out if its recent decision to reduce its Far Eastern commitment and concentrate its military effort on the defence of Europe was the right one. When the war games ended and the troops had a chance to relax, it was time for the politicians and the generals to decide if it had all been worthwhile. Certainly, the Norwegians learnt something. Their northern brigade, playing the part of the orange enemy, admitted that their battle with the Canadians had shown them how vulnerable they were to guerrilla warfare. Fortunately, all wounds were more apparent than real. Like most previous NATO exercises, Strong Express was a valuable test of communications, organization, and logistics. Whether it'll have any immediate political influence in the West, or whether it'll convince the Russians that Norway is not as vulnerable as it looks, remains to be seen. At sea, the movements of these British and American ships were closely watched by the Russians, who've shown more interest in this exercise than in any previous one. They had no fewer than 27 ships and scores of aircraft watching every NATO move. Even so, they were careful to keep their distance. But their very presence served as a reminder of the reasons for Strong Express and why NATO exists at all. <laughs> 